just about ready now. Um, Micah, is there the video for logging into the translation? Have you been playing that already for the participants who need it? Yes, it's been going on uh, for the last five minutes. Okay, great. So then I think we should uh, get started. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning to some of you. Um, Welcome to the Health Dimension webinar for the Civil Society Consultation on the UNDP-led LGBTI Inclusion Index Indicators Development. My name is Felicity Daly. I'm the Global Research Coordinator for Outright Action International. And my co-chair is Adam Bourne, Associate Professor at the Australian Research Center in Sex, Health and Society. This session is being simultaneously translated into French and Spanish. So I'd like to ask everyone to speak slower than you would normally. So about 20% slower so that the translators can keep up. If you're receiving translation and have any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box. We have some observers today from multilateral organizations and other non-civil society partners. You are welcome to be here, but are kindly asked not to contribute to this discussion, which has been developed for civil society inputs. We have about 75 participants who signed up for the call, and I can see a fair amount have now joined. And we're going to take inputs one by one. If you would like to speak once we get through the introductory part in the next few minutes, please write your name and speak in the chat box. I know some people have called in under, joined in on their other people's accounts. So please put your own name and the word speak in the chat box and we will create a speakers list from that and invite people to speak one by one. So overall, we just don't want people talking over other participants or the chair so we can keep a good flow of conversation, but orderly. We'd like you to make your interventions concise um, and your comments focused on the criteria. Um, we'd really rather you do that um, than give us some sort of anecdotal feedback um, or anything around a national context. We know that from the health dimension, LGBTI exper people experience exclusion every day. And I think many of us are very aware of those contexts. Today's conversation is about the draft indicators that have been developed and shared with you. So we hope everyone understands and accepts this is the frame of our discussion. We also want to stress we hope everyone's had the chance to either join the introductory call or listen to the recording of the introductory webinar, which happened on the 19th of September, because that's what makes it clear what the inclusion index is, that it is an outcome of a consultative process which included civil society participation in 2015. And it also details how this civil society consultation fits into the consultation now around indicator development. If you remain unclear about any of that background, unfortunately, we will not have the time to get into a discussion about that on this webinar. So if you do have something that you want to note, please either put it in the chat box and we will address it later. Um, or you can write back to the indicators at RFSL email with comments. Um, so if you have listened to that uh, recording, you know this webinar is part of a series being conducted during this week and a broader consultation process being led by UNDP and the World Bank. We want to mention that throughout the consultation process, difficult choices will need to be made about the number of indicators that can be operationalized for each dimension and for the index overall at this initial stage of the index's development. So having said all that, I'd like us to just briefly review the list of draft indicators which have been proposed for measuring the health dimension. So Micah, if you will please bring up the first slide on a slide set that goes through uh, the six indicators that have been proposed for this section. Thank you very much. Uh, so, technical checkup. Can you see this on screen? Because uh, there was a problem with the video earlier. So I just want to make sure that everybody can see what is on the screen. Yes. 
and other people are saying yes. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. So as we can see, I'll just briefly go through these. This is uh, the background reading that you provided in advance of this call. And for the health um, dimension, there have been a number of indicators that have been proposed. And the first set of indicators have to do with an aspect of inclusion around access to SOGI-esque sensitive health care with two indicators. One, the first one being patient non-discrimination protections with an indicator that sets the presence of non-discrimination policies by providers that specifically include, include SOGI-esque um, and measure prevention of or denial, preventing the denial of care. The second there is medical record protections and the protection of medical records. I won't go into all the comments and justifications, but across both these indicators, uh, it's been proposed that they can measure every uh, population in the LGBTI community. The next slide goes into um, two more indicators. I want to click on that one. Thank you. The aspect of depathologization of LGBTI people, the uh, indicator being no diagnosis, and the depathologization of variations in sex characteristics, sexual orientation, and gender identity and expression in medical guidelines, protocols, and classifications, with an example of the WHO's international classification of diseases. The second on this page is access to treatment, the name of the indicator being source of care, and the indicator being the percentage of persons who have a specific source of ongoing care. Again, both of these being able, we think, to be measured across all LGBT and I populations. And lastly, the next slide, we uh, wanted to look at a specific health concern and have looked at HIV AIDS, uh, looking at HIV incidence and prevalence, and the indicator being uh, prevalence and incidence of HIV infections. Again, that's proposed to be collected across all of the subpopulations. And finally, the other indicator that's been proposed for the health dimension is health status and self-rated health, which would measure in general uh, what a patient or a person say, your health is excellent, very good, fair, poor. This is a WHO standard variation. How is your health in general with a response scale being very good, good, fair, bad, or very bad? So you've had that to look at over the weekend. Um, Thank you, Micah. We're gonna just close that slide for now. Um, what we wanna do now is begin a discussion of the indicators, and I'd like to ask my co-chair, Dr. Adam Bourne, for their initial reactions and how they've been framed. So, Adam, will you please share your impressions of how you think these would work in practice and any um, amendments that you would propose for them? Thank you very much, Felicity, and um, a very good morning from here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, as Felicity said, my task was to provide some initial responses to these indicators to help set the scene for a broader discussion. Now, two things I think to draw your attention to in the um, introductory briefing notes are about the meaning of inclusion as it's operationalized here in the access or in outcomes. So in access to health or in the achievement of positive health outcomes. I think it's important that everyone bears that in mind. And also that we have a goal to, um, to do subgroup analysis of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex as separate groups. Um, wherever possible. So hold those two things constant. Now, as the authors of the indicators say very clearly, 
human life is multifaceted. So you cannot capture anything as broad as health in just a few indicators. This is always going to be imperfect. And I very much acknowledge that right from the outset. It's about um, finding the right balance between things that are feasible and achievable and speak to those health issues that we are most concerned by. So any critique I offer now is you know, kind of should be seen in, in, in that light. Um, so firstly, in the first indicator, access to SOGI-esque sensitive healthcare and the president presence of non-discriminatory policies. This is a statement of inclusion intent. This is saying that the, the providers of healthcare are seeking to be more inclusive in their practice by the presence of such policies. And this could be searchable via uh, online, by a review of a document analysis, or via surveys of providers themselves, so feels quite achievable. The challenge is that it doesn't get at the actual experience of discrimination, which may be the most significant barrier to access and uptake of services in the first place. So having a policy of non-discrimination doesn't translate to um, an absence of discriminatory practice. So we just have to acknowledge that uh, as its primary limitation. In the protection of medical records, I'm guessing the desire here, this is born of a desire to see medical records, um, to not see medical records of what are often criminalized populations pass to the police or to media or to other hostile agencies, which we can all definitely acknowledge is a concern in many countries. I think my reflection on this one though was that um, if the, um, I'd hope that the ethos of protection um, would already be highlighted uh, and uh, in place by the presence of non-discriminatory policies. So I, I guess I was, I was reflecting and wondering whether to some extent the, the kind of ethos of that indicator would actually be captured to a large extent by the first one as well. So I guess I'm framing that for discussion. In the depathologization of LGBT people, probably the indicator I like the most and feel most secure in. Um, and I think the authors outline a series of ways in which this data could be captured. Um, I think that could also include a review of policies by national psychiatry, psychology, or counseling professional bodies. Do they have affirmative policies in place relating to LGBTI people? Do they have they made statements um, against the idea of gay conversion therapies, for example? But like with the first indicator, it doesn't quite get at the experience of pathologization, which is often at the core of poor mental health outcomes among these populations. So again, just kind of framing um, what its kind of key limitation is. In terms of um, access to treatment and the proportion of people who have access to ongoing care, I mean, essentially, this is about health um, coverage. Um, and my concern perhaps is that this feels a little nebulous, um, which has been reflected in some of the broader SDG discussion on this point. Um, and a source of care can involve a range of state, private or traditional um, providers. And so interpretation and cross-country analysis can be, can be quite challenging. But I think more fundamentally, most research tends to indicate that the main problem with safe is about safe access for LGBTI people rather than about coverage in general. And if there's a proposal for tier three data here, so data that we would have to um, collect um, via a survey, I wonder if it's worth considering some form of standardized measure for discrimination in healthcare or a measure of safety in healthcare that might be the barrier to access. Or indeed, as another alternative, have an indicator that's more specific to certain subsections of the population. So perhaps the proportion of trans or gender diverse people in a country who feel that they have access to gender affirming services, for example. 
In relation to the fifth indicator, prevalence or incidence of HIV infection, I mean, its, it's major strength is that it acknowledges the massively disproportionate burden of HIV among gay and bisexual men and among transgender people. And I think it's very important to make the call once again for better disaggregation of data to help document that disparity better. But also, importantly, to capture uh, incidents among lesbian and intersex people, which many people have called for for a really, really long time, but what we've actually made remarkably little progress. I think my concern, perhaps, is that currently this is the only solid condition-related health outcome for health for LGBTI in the list of indicators, and it's very tilted towards gay and bisexual men and to transgender. And we've spent a really, really long time trying to assuage the idea that the only health issue of importance to LGBTI is HIV. And I think I'd be worried if this was the only tangible health outcome um, that we are left with. And so I think it's worth considering whether there are opportunities to have another indicator that relates to broader sexual and reproductive health, um, to things like uh, access or provision of appropriate sex education, or is this an area where we should have a specific intersex related indicator relating to non-discriminatory and consensual reproductive health services? And just finally, on self-reported health status. Now, I think the key strength here is in the simplicity of this indicator and how it's been, it's a standardized scale and used in lots of cross-country analysis. It is still rather Northern Hemisphere weighted um, and it's used far less commonly in lower middle income countries. Um, and so there could be some concern about the currency this would have with policymakers in other countries if we're trying to use this data as a, as a kind of rallying point for better provision of services to LGBTI. So I guess again, and linked to my previous comment, is it possible to have another um, possibly more tangible health outcome instead? So, or as well as, um, so a measure of problematic alcohol use, which we know is from lots of surveys is significantly higher among lesbian and bisexual women, or coverage of harm reduction services that address stimulant use, um, which we know are, um, is significantly higher among gay and bisexual men, but often isn't catered for in, harm in traditional harm reduction services, or indeed mental health. And some of the most concerning data we have among all LGBTI people relates to high levels of anxiety or depression. And these aren't necessarily always easy things to capture, but there are a range of survey tools that we could use. And so I think it's just useful to think about whether that's something we could capture, have an indicator relating to either mental health outcomes or mental health uh, access. That's my kind of two pence worth for the moment. Um, as I said, these are all framed in terms of um, the the limit, you know, the, the inherent limitations of indicators. Um, and it's about acknowledging what we can, what we're willing to live with, but uh, and, and what might be um, refined in the future. Thank you, Adam. Um, Michael, will you please bring up the second slide set now, which looks at the set of criteria that we've asked everyone to use when they start um, interrogating and reacting to the indicators. Great, thank you. I'm not going to read these out at the moment. I've started to build the speakers list and I will continue to take names in order. We have so far about eight people who've indicated they wanted to speak and that's building. So the first person on the list who's um, indicated that they want to make an intervention is Genede. 
Um, yes. Uh, it's Gennady. Gennady. Um, uh, it, yeah. Uh, thank you for correction. Uh, I, I would like to suggest uh, uh, some possible indicators to add to the list. Uh, just continue uh, uh, continuing Adam's idea. And uh, uh, the uh, first indicator would be access to funding for community organizations under national HIV, STI, sexual and mental health strategies. Um, and uh, uh, the measurement is existence of sufficient financial systems for community organizations uh, transparently and competently uh, accessing to uh, the public funding. And uh, uh, the, the, the second uh, is existing of coordinating bodies, structures for making LGBT community representatives engaged in health policy making. Thank you. Thank you. The second speaker on the list is Morgan Carpenter. Um, hello, thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, introduction and the explanations to, to both of you, Felicity and Adam. Um, it's good to see how the indicators are developing um, over the last couple of years. So I have a few comments. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on the, the issues for um, people born with intersex variations. Um, and to start off with, I think uh, it's important to recognize that there is a split uh, when it comes to issues related to intersex experiences of the health system between health and the session on violence. Uh, and that's really important um, because the, the, uh, the, the indicators to do with violence will focus, appear to be focusing I hope they will continue to do so after the session later this week uh, on uh, issues to do with non-consensual uh, forced and coercive interventions. Um, and here, the indicators to do with health provide an opportunity to um, to examine other issues around access to health care, which have rarely been examined from an intersex perspective. Um, and I think this brings me on to another point I want to make, which is that I, I would not in, in any way or shape or form consider intersex to be a subpopulation of LGBTI. Uh, what we have here, I think, uh, are multiple intersecting distinct and different populations. Uh, and that has implications for not just the indicators themselves, but also about how um, populations are um, how distribution channels to try and access information on different populations work and function because so many intersex people are neither uh, same sex attracted nor transgender um, and trying to uh, engage that population in um, research processes is particularly challenging when it is framed within an LGBTI framework. So it, these are not subgroups to my mind, but they are distinct populations. Um, and there needs to be care to look at distribution channels that are appropriate for each population. And also then the disaggregation of the data that comes out of this. Now, um, a few other issues. Um, I agree with Adam that, that inclusion policies um, are problematic because the implementation is often challenging um, and particularly within an Australian context I can see a huge distinction between the rhetoric of inclusion particularly with, within policies and frameworks that are framed around LGBTI uh, and the reality on the ground which is still um, you know still the existence of forced and coercive practices but also um, policy frameworks around inclusion that assume something else that, that Adam mentioned about depathologization when Adam mentioned psychology and psychiatry uh, as the, um, the sources of pathologization. But for intersex populations, that's not true at all. Well, it can be true as well, but we're, we're primarily talking about the pathologization of bodies. Uh, and there are different institutions involved in those 
processes of medicalization and pathologization. Um, and there are also some complexities about, about um, how much of the um, intersex experience can be depathologized when some people will continue to need healthcare for issues associated with their embodiment. Um, so that's the comment really about the inclusion policies and acknowledging the limitations of those. Um, and again, that, that kind of um, reinforces my earlier comments about disaggregation. Yeah, you, you know, we're not going to see any particular impact or relevance to intersex populations, for example, from uh, inclusion policies or frameworks around sexual orientation. Um, that's something I need to point out. Um, when it comes to issues around access and coverage, um, we know that intersex populations are frequently lost to follow up in a transition from pediatric care to uh, adult services. And um, I guess this also highlights another issue about the experience of, of child populations as well as issues to do with adult populations. Um, and reinforces my previous comments about how to access uh, populations who are quite hard to reach, particularly within LGBT settings. Um, I was a bit confused by Adam's comments about HIV. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what I think of those yet, and might wish to come back to that discussion a bit later on. Can I? Yeah. Can I ask that people don't have reactions to um, what a, a previous speaker has said? Um, rather, you use the criteria that have been set. So the first three that are on the screen now are sort of like major criteria to reflect on. Micah, if you wanted to bring up the second slide, which is identifying uh, around the technical inputs on the construction, drafting, language of the proposed indicators and the key gaps. And um, Thank you, Morgan, because you've concentrated a number of your comments on the key gaps in terms of considering um, LGBTI populations. And yes, we've used this term subpopulations or subgroups. It's not to minimize uh, distinctions between uh, the different groups, but we know we're talking about different uh, communities, different identities, different classifications. So um, just how to. Yeah. I finish that conversation. I think what, what the language that you're using there is actually very significant because it's not just the populations are, are, are different and overlap. It's also that the age groups impacted are different. Like um, talking about identities does not actually help us to, um, to, to gather information on issues affecting infants and children with intersex variations. And if we're looking at indicators on LGBTI populations, then they are a significant part of our population whose needs must not be ignored. Yeah, and they don't identify as intersex because often they don't even have an identity at all, you know. Yeah, that's understood. Okay, um, if I might just go to another speaker now, we still have um, 13 people who've signed up to speak total. Uh, we've gotten through two. So would, can we move on to another comment? And I'd like to ask Justice Ellsfield, uh, who's the next speaker. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to um, make a first comment about the overall framework. I think there's um, two large issue areas that are missing from, um, from this whole framework. Uh, one is housing, uh, which I think is really important and that's not showing up anywhere. And the other one is um, uh, is around um, how uh, people who are incarcerated are faring, and um, um, uh, whether or not LGBTI people are disproportionately incarcerated. Um, okay, so well, I, are hear, I hear that. I'm just going to reflect back on the original uh, outline for the conversation. Is that the Five. Going to health. <laughs> okay, okay. Because those dimensions were set through a consultative process and already difficult decisions were made about what could be used. So yes, now on to health. Thank you, Justice. 
Um, I, I think um, my comments are quite detailed, actually. Um, for HIV, I think it's crucial that we um, disaggregate um, data on uh, trans women, trans men, and people of other genders, um, because that's often not done, and that um, leaves the uh, leaves trans men and um, don't identify as trans women um, within the trans community out of uh, any data collection. Um, access to treatment um, also needs a specific mentioning of access to um, um, to transition-related treatment because um, there's such a big gap between access to any kind of treatment, healthcare treatment, and access to transition treatment. Um, that if we do not disaggregate that data, we um, we are missing. Um, we're, mi we're missing a lot um, and too much in my um, in my eyes. And then um, with regards to medical records, I think it's really important to uh, to not just look at the absence um, of medical rec records, but also or or the um, the uh, safekeeping of medical records, but also looking at whether or not medical records actually identify LGBTI people in a useful and um, uh, way that, that um, takes privacy into consideration. Because without that data, there is no health research on LGBTI communities. And, um, and that's a really big gap right now. Um, I agree that, that we need to look at outcomes and, uh, rather than policies, um, because policies are um, no guarantee for any kind of outcomes. They can be a step towards outcomes, but um, they, in, in my years of practice, I'm more and more convinced that um, um, if a policy is not followed through, there's no use for the policy. So that's my comments. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Chelsea. Chelsea Ricker? Okay. Yeah, your yeah. voice is quite loud. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I will try to be brief. I just wanted to throw a couple of more considerations on the side of um, slightly more positive or aspirational indicators looking at inclusion of um, LGBTI specific training for health workers, looking at coverage for um, specific health needs, including needs for intersex and trans um, in health insurance policy, um, and looking at protection against discrimination in health insurance coverage. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Mauro. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have just uh, two very brief points uh, because Morgan completely covered most of what I want to say. Uh, first, I think that when it comes to the about repatriation, there is an important link missing there, which is uh, patriotization being a legal requirement to access to other rights, like the access to legal recognition and the access to transitional healthcare. And both of them has a huge uh, impact in general healthcare. So it's not only about people being uh, pathologized by psychology and psychiatry, or by policies at the, you know, in, in general, in these professional associations at the national level, but about the connection between diagnosis and legal regulations for, for human rights. That's uh, one, of, one of the issues. The, the other, is I share with Morgan the same question about HIV, especially if we consider that a cross-cutting issue, uh, because I don't I don't see how uh, HIV has the same relevance for intersex people than from LGTB pe people, according to the to the uh, statistics that we that we have. And I would really like, you know, to, to propose like a, the possibility of consider a, another indicator, which is like human rights violations in medical settings and the, the consequences at the level of health 
as as a, another cross cutting issue. In in this case, touching all the populations at stake. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Jose. Jose from Metro Charity. Okay, perhaps they've stepped away. No, they're still on the line. Um, Jose, or if not, shall we go to Jack Byrne and then we can come back to Jose? Go Thanks, ahead, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I was just going to speak to a couple of there. One was um, depathologization and the comments that were, were mentioned originally, it was very unclear to me. Um, so I share the concerns that everyone's raised, including Adam, about exactly what would be measured there. Um, and the notes that Odd made were similar to to, to, to Mardo's that pathologization has a huge impact on you know legal gender recognition and protection under the law so how would that be measured and are we talking about the absence of diagnoses that um, or are we talking specifically about mental health diagnoses? So is it de-psychopathologization we're, me we're measuring? Um, yeah, so, it's, so, I, so and I don't think the one about what, what policies um, psychiatrists or um, psychologists have is sufficient. Maybe it needs, um, yeah, so I, th I think it needs it need some rethinking about that one. Agree with also the one about access to um, health services, and I think it was Adam was the first person who mentioned it, that it, it, maybe it needs to be narrowed down. And if we're looking, you know, access to gender-affirming health care, I think is a really important one to, to look at. And I know that we've just done a, a new NDP was involved in it, a, um, a regional trans health meeting um, that was held in Bangkok across 14, 15 countries in Asia. And we did a mapping report for that. And we came up with, you know, something that we could actually measure across all of those countries. So, you know, there was some beginning thinking about that. And I liked the, the suggestion around human rights violations in medical settings. And, you know, even if it had to start off with, a, with one that we, you know, we've got enough UN um, experts speaking out about forced or coerced sterilisation, you know, we could maybe start with that. So that's all from me. Thank you, Jack. Okay, Jose, do you want to take yourself off mute? Very good. Thank you. You go ahead now. Uh, perfect. Thanks. I guess my few comments is the first one around mental health. Uh, and is it like, as Adam was mentioning, mental health and the importance of including mental health, would this be one specific indicator in the list or is it something that will be across all the other indicators and how mental health is being affected by all the other already mentioned or, 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 or identified indicators? Uh, and then I guess the other one is really, my other comment will be related to what are the aspects uh, that affect uh, these health outcomes uh, in the case of HIV and of mental health and of any other uh, health outcome that, that, that it's included is what are the aspects that, that are or might affect these, this situation as it could be things related to, as someone was mentioning, housing or a uh, um, migration journey or, or or things like this, and how, how would that be related or how would that be seen in these different uh, in the, in these different health outcomes or in the indicators that include health outcome? And, and in the case of HIV, I guess the more than the incidence or prevalence for me is about what, what could be or, or what are other issues in 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 HIV as as an indicator? Things like a uh, co-infection and and other health or poor health outcomes that might happen after or or within HIV as a as a main criteria. 
Thank you. Thank you. I think there was a question there about whether mental health is uh, sort of inherent to all the indicators that are proposed here. And my sense is that it, it's not, um, and that they're mainly focused on um, physical health. And so I think people should keep that in mind for their comments um, if they feel strongly that there needs to be a greater perspective brought in or a separate health, mental health oriented indicator set. Uh, the next speaker on the list is Quirine Lengeek. Hi, this is Quirine Lengeek from YWCA Netherlands. Uh, I have a comment on the indicator patient non-discrimination protection. Um, as Adam Bourne already highlighted, the experience of discrimination cannot be measured by this indicator. However, besides denial of care based on subject status, there could be looked into policies curtailing access to full enjoyment of health in other ways, like parental consent, HIV status disclosure requirements, or forced uh, divorce and sterilization for trans people. In this way, uh, quote unquote, legal discrimination that could impact an LGBTI person's health or access to healthcare can still be measured. Um, and that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have Sonia Ariola. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate this discussion and the respect for complexity while attempting to gather data simply. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of the concerns that Adam raised by offering um, some recommendations for items that could address it. And uh, in this case, it looks like one of the things that you raised, Adam, was that there's a difference between the uh, indicators that are more structural at the policy level versus the individual or outcome uh, focused indicators. And so while it, that it is the case that in my opinion, the items that you have at the policy and structural level are good and it matters and it's important to find that out. There need to be more indicators that tell us the experiences of these uh, important populations as they navigate this. And so one of the recommendations I would make is to consider some of the items from the Global Men's Health and Rights Survey uh, that would meet criteria for both tier one and tier three. For tier one, it could meet criteria um, because we already have data for approximately 3,000 cis and transgender men who have sex with men. Um, this has been translated into seven languages for which the validity of the items stand up very strongly and in 120 different countries. So in particular, there's an item on provider discrimination toward there are three items actually, provided discrimination toward uh, transgender men who have sex with men and one for uh, cisgender men who have sex with men. Um, and my recommendation would be to either include all three or pick the one that has the mo carries the most variance and we could figure that out to then adapt it for all the populations um, because it would be important to have it separately for each group. And then for the question about um, uh, uh, avoidance of health care. So we could find out at the structural level how health care discrimination might appear and make the inference, but we also have specific questions on whether participants in this study avoided health care. And again, we could provide data that tell us what it might look like across 120 countries for men who have sex with men, uh, both trans and cisgender, but we could then adapt the question if there really were room at tier three level to ask the question anew. And there are many other items in the survey that would address some of these. These are just two examples. So the pitch here is to consider including these items that were developed by uh, the uh, population of interest for the popula population of interest and have been validated across seven languages in, in across all regions of the world. The other um, I would recommend is the WHO quality of life. To several people's comments about mental health, um, the quality of life survey that the WHO developed has also been validated 
across multiple regions and um, languages and it holds up very strongly and it has four subdomains one is for health i'm sorry for physical one is for psychological and one is for environmental and one is for social and again because so much data exists already um, not necessarily tailored to any particular group one could fathom looking at the data to figure out which of the items are carrying the most variance or account for most of what we're trying to understand, let's say psychological well-being, and then uh, use that item that's already been validated in so many different populations and languages and include it. And that would, you know, altogether, everything I'm saying would probably only add between three and four items to what you already have. And I think that could help flush it out. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I'm glad you mentioned um, the pretty broad data set that you've been referring because I think it's important for us all to reflect on the first criteria here, which is in the first slide. So, Mike, if you want to slip, slip back to the first slide, um, it is whether indicators being proposed or that we are proposing a new are going to help track and compare across different countries um, and whether an indicator is relevant and available for a wide range of countries. Um, and thirdly, would the use of any indicator necessitate the generation of new data? So just to keep that in mind, I'm going to continue to go through the speakers list. And we have Julio Dantas next. Hi, and again, I want to thank everyone for, for this opportunity for us to participate and, and for the explanation in the beginning. I would, I would just add three points to many of the comments that have already been made. One is a big point, I think, in all of the indicators that I feel that once I reviewed it, what I saw uh, were what I'm going to call the big groups, lesbians, gays, and adults. Uh, and that it felt like everybody else was a subgroup. Um, for our work that we do in Chile and seven other countries in Latin America, the issue of children becoming invisible and in indicators of these types um, becomes very simple because we're talking about the general LGBTI community. Um, so I really want to emphasize that in all of the indicators, but specific to health, uh, because we do work uh, in a context where we have some of the highest levels of, of uh, teenage suicide in Latin America. Um, the issue of mental health here, um, I think, really needs to be emphasized. And, and I want to agree with a couple of the ideas that have come up on the other comments that perhaps it should be a separate mental health um, um, piece uh, to this because it, it's complex both in terms of, of access uh, in, in, in getting great care, but, but beyond that uh, is that in many cases when people under 18 years of age or 16 years of age are trying to access different services, their parents are the ones that become the obstacle to getting that service. So how do we identify what some of the obstacles that these children are going through uh, in, in, as we're trying to gather data? Uh, and that's what we see a lot here is, is children who are put in conversion therapy by their parents who are seeking assistance uh, by the, the Ministry of Health and can't get that assistance. So how do, how do they show up in some way uh, so that we can see what their what their well-being levels are. Uh, and then the, the third point I wanted to make is, in case you don't already, you're not already aware, uh, we worked very closely with the Gay and Lesbian um, um, Student, um, the Gay and Lesbian Straight Education Network in the United States, and we're able to do uh, school climate surveys in seven countries in the region. So we have a lot of data around schooling, which I know is another section, and I think the, the session is tomorrow. Um, but in some of our countries, we also were able to measure uh, uh, mental health levels uh, of the kids that responded. So that data is, is also available. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so the next speaker is Caroline Ore. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I have some uh, short comments. Um, I was thinking about the access to SOGS sensitive healthcare uh, to if we're proposing a set of indicators where we have to um, survey populations I think we could also maybe put in one indicator there uh, where we survey um, people's um, what do you say the um, 
discriminatory, like their uh, discriminatory treatment in healthcare settings in the last 12 months or something like if people have experienced that or not. Um, so that's one thing. I also agree that there's a gap uh, about mental health and either one can measure if one does this uh, surveying of populations, um, one can measure suicide ideation and attempts in the last 12 months. Um, or, as Sonia said, the, use the WHO quality of life scale, which is also a good measuring tool. Um, I was thinking about an indicator on HIV uh, since most countries already um, report on their the 1999 target and i think that since trans people and msm are uh, very affected by hiv the 1990 goal is really important uh, for these populations so if one if we, we want to measure like how well uh, countries um, deal with HIV, they already measured this um, for the UNAIDS reporting. Um, what else? Yeah, as Justice and some other people have said, I think it, to measure access to treatment, it's super, super important to, access, to measure access or to gender affirming healthcare. Um, in the different countries. Yeah, I think that's more or less my comments. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, we have Emily to speak next. Yeah, hi there, everyone. Um, so I just want to start with uh, the, the access to treatment or access to or safe access to treatment as it was framed at, at one point and think about this in, in, a, in an experiential way um, and think about, for example, the kinds of experiences that um, as a, a, a lesbian trans woman I might, I might get if I went into a health clinic and was, was asking for, uh, for, for services that had nothing to do with, um, with my sexual orientation or gender identity and, and expression. And a lot of people experience um, such situations where um, they're asked about all kinds of things that have no relevance to the, the medical condition which, with, with which they present. And so I, I think there's some a, a, an indicator that sort of captured that that experience of discrimination when seeking health care of any of, for, for any condition um, might um, might be a useful one, um, and it goes to some extent or is linked to um, some points that have been made around uh, whether whether that uh, the people are avoiding health facilities or whether they're um, self medicating because they don't want to access those uh, those official health services. Um, that might also, if, if that was oriented around um, general health outcomes, then that might to some extent um, go to the concern of, of whether um, listing HIV AIDS specifically highlights um, an, an issue that, that we've been trying to, as, as has been pointed out before, um, so it's, it's not the only health concern um, that uh, is, is relevant for, for development organisations. Um, on the depathologization de de one, um, as a trans woman, I certainly ag agree that while that's that, that's that's a good thing, um, that there would need that, that would be good to have a positive um, side to that one as well. So, is there access to um, supportive health um, care that uh, the trans people do need? Also, I certainly agree that um, that uh, psychosocial support, uh, mental health issues are really important. If they can't be here, then I think they, they really should be somewhere. I mean, thinking about the experiences of, of younger trans kids in Australia, um, depression and, and suicide rates that are, are far higher for other parts of the population is probably important to capture that in a set of indicators um, somewhere, if, if, if not here. Um, in some work that we've I've done in um, training for for healthcare workers in addressing the needs of people of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, and sex characteristics has been suggested by um, some people in, in the in the health um, sector, and so I think that would be a good one to take a look at. We could also take a look at what funding has specifically been put aside for um, sexual orientation, gender identity and six characteristics inclusive healthcare, whether that's in, in national health budgets um, or, or other kinds of other kinds of budgets. Um, I think 
one question I had was whether it, it, it's whether it's possible to have a some kind of meta indicator that looks at the extent to which the health indicators within the existing SDGs are CERGIS conclusive. That might be difficult, um, but it might be there could be an indicator at the, ex the extent to which CERGIS conclusive data is being captured around all of those other indicators. I guess as part of that effort to read ourselves back into into the SDGs. Um, uh, just a couple of other quick ones. Uh, access to, things like access to water, sanitation and hygiene are potentially interesting precursors um, to, to thinking about um, people's health um, and, and whether some kind of measure of people's access to water, sanitation and hygiene might be interesting. Uh, there are some, uh, I think, looking at those cross-cutting intersections um, for additional disaggregation and whether we can do that for things like age, but also whether people live in rural or urban areas, um, which is also a really important you know, distinction for the kinds of access to healthcare that people get and what people, what, ex, what might be an official policy and, and possibly even an, an implemented uh, policy in a capital city might be entirely different, you know, 100 kilometres away from, from that capital city. Um, I, I was tempted to throw in a question about whether alternatives to the LGBTI framing had been considered given that that was uh, such a big issue in the ILGA conference in Bangkok last uh, year, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you would want to go, go into that territory here, but in particular, I guess, where non-binary identities fit within that and whether there's some specific guidance that could be offered. So, for example, in Fiji, where does Vakasea Lua Lua fit into this particular um, topology? Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Uh, the next speaker is Taigo. Okay, thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Well, I basically agree with uh, Carolina. I think that the measure on HIV is good to, though we need to improve it. I think it's really important to include uh, an indicator to measure the percentage of people in treatment. And this data is easily collected because UNAIDS already have it. So I think it's really, well, it could improve the, improve the, the indicator at all. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Susanna. Susanna, you're on a phone line, not a, um, a web link, it looks like. Are you muted? Susanna Freed? Okay, we can come back to her. Um, I thought, since that's most of our speaker list until we see anyone else um, indicate that they'd like to speak, I thought we could give um, Adam a chance to kind of come back round to a number of the points made. I wanted to say, firstly, that Emily's point about sensitizing the indicators for the health SDGs, that there are three people on this call, myself, Adam and Stephen Leonelli from MSMGF, who have co-authored a paper that looks at not all of the targets of SDG3 on health and well-being, but many of them. And uh, we have uh, suggested SOGI-esque sensitivity uh, changes to uh, those indicators. And uh, we hope that that's a useful resource uh, for this exercise, but as they are many uh, of those indicators, and in this exercise, we are probably coming up with a list of under 10 indicators across the health dimension. There's again, difficult choices to be made. So I wanted to note that and then give Adam the floor to come back. Thank you very much, Felicity. It was really interesting listening to all of those responses to the indicators and the discussion. Um, there was obviously a whole load of things that um, fell out of that conversation. I was trying to keep track of some of the the common threads. Um, I think certainly one was around pathologization and the indicator specifically speaking to the pathologization of LGBTI people. Um, and it seems like there's some work to do in 
um, refining or honing uh, what that might mean and how it might be operationalized. Um, and I certainly entirely agree with the point that that Morgan made that this isn't um, simply a, a psychiatry or a psychology issue, but that it's around the pathologization of bodies. And I and I certainly wasn't seeking to to kind of minimize that. I mean, it's something we should be, you know, except, you know, very attentive to. Um, uh, and I, and I think the point that I think it was Emily was making there towards the end around broadly about access to supportive and affirmative healthcare, um, around whether there's a way of framing an indicator which was much more specific about people's belief that they could access such affirmative healthcare um, should they uh, should they feel they need it. Um, the second kind of key reflection seemed to be around discrimination in healthcare settings and a lot of people kind of um, reinforcing the, the notion that just the presence of the policy isn't, may not be sufficient um, because we know that in many instances where there are protective policies, there's still a great deal of discrimination that occurs. Um, so we need to think carefully about what we would be happy with as an indicator to capture um, something around discrimination in healthcare settings. Um, if we speak very broadly about human rights violations, um, that's quite challenging to operationalize within um, a survey, which is what would be required. We'd need to think of something very concise or discreet. Um, and so we'd have to think, would we be happy with a measure which is just generally around, have you experienced discrimination on the basis of your sexual orientation uh, um, or gender uh, characteristics or expression? Or would we want something more specific as well, perhaps, um, which is about, um, experience of forced or coerced um, sterilization. I don't have an answer to this. I'm just I'm just kind of framing things that are perhaps key questions that we might want to examine um, moving forwards. Um, and and I think the third really was around mental health, and it, it does seem that there's a fair degree of support for uh, a measure of mental health. Um, several people asked kind of how this might occur or or proposed suggestions for it. There are a, um, a big, big range of mental health measures. And as uh, Sonia um, pointed out, there are some that the WHO already utilize and endorse. And I think for, for clarity and simplicity, we should perhaps examine those first and kind of establish whether those uh, meet the needs of examining mental health among these populations. Um, but it does seem like that's definitely uh, an area that we should be reflecting on. Um, and finally, I actually liked, I'm sorry, I didn't capture who said it, but the suggestion for an indicator in, H, in relation to HIV, which is about treatment. Um, and it, it actually struck me that that's a much better signifier of accessibility of a service or a, a, a program or an intervention, which is one of the things we're trying to get at here is access and outcomes. If you look at HIV treatment, that's a much better indicator of access um, than just incidence is. So I guess just to kind of reinforce that point, I thought was quite a good one. And thank you, Adam. Okay, we've got another speaker who uh, was unable to uh, make themselves known before. Soren, would you like to intervene now? Thank you, yes. Um, there's one area I think uh, we have not touched much upon, which is the access to uh, medically assisted uh, reproduction. And um, there's quite a number of dimensions uh, in that. Uh, that could, for instance, be uh, do a transitioning person have access to deposit uh, gametes. Um, we have a lot of, of structural uh, discrimination there because uh, the definition, the local definition of a family may influence uh, what uh, health services you get access to. And that can come in, in, in very specific flavors, which we, for instance, see in, in uh, the European Union, um, because the uh, possibility for an HIV positive man uh, to become a father uh, is actually um, uh, uh, not possible uh, uh, because of EU, uh, European legislation, um, because of the definition, what is a couple? Uh, if, if it is a, a, a gay man and a woman, 
they are not a couple, they're not a family, and therefore they cannot get access uh, to that reproductive health. I think there's a number of very important uh, measures uh, or dimensions that would uh, fill in to, um, to that access um, uh, measure. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to note something that I see coming up here is that we have um, a lot of suggestions for um, indicators that would require new data collection and are aspirational um, to collect it as this index develops and as responses develop. So I would like everyone to sort of think about in terms of the, um, the tier one and two um, kinds of indicators or the feasibility criteria in those indicators, that potentially are available now, are there particular ones that um, people would be interested in seeing prioritized? So if we bring up, Micah, the, the list of indicators again, those three slides there, um, we have a few of them that have been marked as feasibility tier, uh, two, and they're on probably the first or the second slide. Yeah. So let me just see the second slide as well. Okay, great. So we've got, um, let's start here then. We've got depath the, the, all the issues around depathologization, and that is seen to be now a feasibility tier two um, that could be assessed by examining local practices um, toward include, including SOGS medical diagnoses in charts or as categories for reimbursement of procedures tr or, and treatment, or by surveying providers and provider organizations about their beliefs. And if you go to the first slide, um, those are the two indicators for access to SOGS sensitive healthcare. Um, the presence of non-discrimination policies, we've discussed quite a lot, protection of medical records, we haven't discussed as much, but both seen as feasible uh, for data collection in the initial stage of this index becoming operational. Um, I would just like to ask amongst those, um, are there any particular priorities? Um, and overall, we've got the sort of 15 minutes left on this discussion. And what we had hoped to have um, coming to a close of this is some sense of convergence, again, knowing that we will not have an exhaustive list of indicators at this initial stage of the index. So again, if people want to speak, I, great, I see one person has put their hand up, so to speak, um, to make an intervention, I will invite uh, people in turn again. Okay, so firstly, we have Morgan who wants to uh, intervene. Thank you, Morgan. Go ahead. Um, thanks, Felicity. Um, yeah, thanks for the discussion. Um, I think one of the key issues that I struggle with is, is that to obtain pretty much, well, to, to, to obtain information on intersex populations, it will require new research for. Um, I think for all of these indicators, there is no current analysis, even at the international level, about what kinds of protections uh, intersex people might have in law in different countries, for example. Uh, I mean, we tend to assume that means there are no protections. Um, so um, that, that's kind of a fundamental issue, uh, um, which will require some grappling with. That's probably all I want to say right now. Thank you. Thank you. And Mauro. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for having to insist on a, on a previous point, but um, I, I agree that the, the indicators that, are, that we are uh, seeing in the first uh, slide can be addressed using the existing um, data, but at the same time, they are formulated in a, in a way that makes them not necessarily relevant for transgender diverse and, and uh, intersex people, and for people who are not adults. So in that sense, 
I believe that we need to correlate or, or to put, you know, in, in, you know, yeah, to, to, cor to correlate uh, how useful they are, you know, considering all the populations that we have and not only the need of um, going through another process of data of data collection be because again the the my my feeling is that we are not only perceived as a subpopulation but as something that comes after a first uh, analysis okay thank you uh Gennady, have i got your name correct this time uh yes um some general uh, comments. Um, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say a uh, big thank to all who come, who made comments, because uh, it, it is it is very very important for my understanding of, of the sense of this work and the uh, variety of uh, uh, possible points of view. Um, uh, for me. Uh, the majority of indicators looks um, uh, like um, the set of uh, 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 the statements about coverage and protection. But um, inclusion, uh, in my view, uh, can also has has also uh, another one dimension, which is ability to act. So uh, probably. Uh, some indicators uh, in health as well as other areas uh, have to measure ability to act, uh, to act uh, for uh, uh, protection of uh, uh, the community, for protection of personal health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This, yeah, this is just general comment. Thank you. Thank you. And Jack? Because um, two quick ones. One was a question around medical record protections. Um, is it possible there to also include um, how long medical records need to be kept for? Um, given that, that I know in, our, in New Zealand that's been an issue for intersex people in terms of being able to find evidence of surgeries that have happened in the past. Um, and I think someone, was it Emily, mentioned, you know, maybe it's, I don't know how useful it is, but I totally agree with the points made that at the moment we're trying to work with, if we're trying to look at what's already there, there are such huge gaps, um, particularly around um, intersex people and trans and gender diverse people. So is it worth collecting data about whether or not national health surveys um, disaggregate by the various populations we're talking about, or is that just measuring what we already know, which is the basis of, you know, why we're having the, inc the inclusion index in the first place? Yes, that's a good point. Um, well, there have all been good points. Um, thank you, everyone. Can can we spend a bit of time? We've got just under ten minutes left. I'd really like um, for people, particularly if you haven't intervened. Um, and you have a strong sense of priorities amongst um, the discussions we have already had where we've identified a few emerging areas that we would like to see added to uh, this potential list of six, changes to the list of six. We'd really like to get a sense of, of the priority um, that, that people collectively agree. So, um, you can make those comments in the chat box if you don't want to speak, or we can um, take another round of, of interventions. They need to be quite brief at this point because we've got only uh, nine minutes left. Uh, Micah, do you want to be, pull up the second, um, actually second and third slides? Just put the second slide up for a moment so people can focus there. I think we've had quite a lot of discussion in both those areas. Maybe the third slide. Okay. Um, 
uh, maybe I'll take uh, my sort of uh, facilitator's prerogative and um, make an intervention that I would like to see. I wonder if we could find a way that HIV incidence and prevalence is a, a kind of co-indicator um, where there's something else additional. We've had just a few interventions here that are looking at other sexual and reproductive health concerns. And um, I think I'd like to also see, I don't know if, if the feasibility is there for us at this stage to raise the issues of um, assisted reproductive technology, which someone um, focused uh, comments on earlier. But I do think that if you were, if we are to keep HIV incidence and prevalence there, um, I'd like to see a secondary indicator and the aspect of inclusion be focused on um, access to SOGX sensitive sexual and reproductive health um, and rights. And therefore you would encompass broader sexual and reproductive health um, issues and um, both the, the broader aspect of sexual rights, but particularly uh, reproductive rights um, that are violated for um, different um, populations uh, for various uh, reasons. And I think we could potentially find some interesting indicators there. Um, if anyone wanted to comment on that at the moment, that's welcome. And again, any focus on um, prioritization. So maybe I'll ask, we, we did hear a number of comments about wanting to add uh, a mental health indicator as a standalone indicator if it's not going to be integrated across these health concerns. Uh, is that uh, something that's widely shared by everyone? Okay, great. So we're seeing a collective um, agreement that there should be um, a mental health indicator. Okay, that's great. And someone has entered a note here. Um, yes, um, a note about additional reproductive health concerns. Yes, I was going to make that one of my examples to the comment I've made about forced and coerced sterilization, which basically limits uh, the reproductive rights of um, both trans and intersex people, but potentially um, anyone else who's had a forced or coerced sterilization, um, who's lesbian, gay, or bi. So that, that's helpful. And Carolina wants to make a comment now. Thank you, Carolina. Hi. Just a short comment about reproductive uh, rights. Um, I think it's very hard to like capture this in one specific uh, question or indicator since there are so many different aspects of how LGBTI people's like reproductive uh, abilities are um, violated um depending on who you are and like how you're you're born like intersex people have totally different like experiences than for example same sex uh a lesbian couple um so i think i think it's has to be really thought through in a good way to capture the diversity of of reproductive uh Right. It's hard, hard task. Good luck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks for noting that. I think that's why I was struggling to come up with um, some good examples as I was making those interventions because it is uh, it's a widely varied set of experiences. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing anyone else putting their hand up, so to speak, at this point. So I think we're really coming to the close here. 
Um, if there's any last comments, um, if Adam, you wanted to make any last intervention. Only to say briefly, Felicity, to reinforce a point you made about wherever possible, we should be seeking to collect tier one and tier two data. Um, I am a, an empirical researcher most of the time, so I always think new data is needed. But in order to make these achievable and feasible as a first stage, and we acknowledge this as a first stage of indicators, we do have to think um, carefully about which ones we can acknowledge are imperfect proxy indicators um, in the first instance. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so I see um, a question about next step um, and deep health and, and Jack's comment. Yes, okay, Jack, that's that's noted. In terms of next steps, we did cover that on the uh, introductory webinar. So this week, uh, the next steps are to go through all of the other dimension webinars. An outcome document is going to be written uh, from these series of webinars that's going to be submitted to the consultants who have framed the draft indicators and that outcome document will be fed into a um, another consultation uh, that's being run by UNDP and the World Bank with a set of data experts both for within the multilateral system and other um, stakeholders who work day in and day out with data collection Morgan Carpenter has asked who are the consultants. As you could see from the background document that was circulated, Lee Badgett, Professor Lee Badgett and Randy Sell, uh, two academics who've worked extensively on SOGESC issues and setting indicators uh, were hired by UNDP and have shared uh, their initial findings. So the outcome document will be um, taken by them, fed into the next stage, and then a, a set of um, stakeholders who focus on data collection will be working with them and uh, the final process will be convened um, by UNDP and the World Bank by the end of the year. Again, if you want further information on that, please write to indicators at rfsl.se or uh, download uh, the introductory webinar and uh, go to the beginning it's covered it's covered well in the first sort of 20 minutes of that call so in closing i want to thank everyone for engaging in this process thank you to adam my co-chair uh, thank you to the interpretation team and thank you to micah for being the the tech support for all of this and i look forward to seeing any of you who are going to join tomorrow's webinar on education which i will also be co-chairing Thank you to our observers as well for um, being our silent witness. I appreciate that as well. Okay, everyone. Bye-bye.